um, we gave you an introduction last time. Laura's going to um, continue the discussion into histiocytic sarcomas, and you know we saw some that some of these weird tumors that arise in these chimeric mice with quote humanized end quote immune systems, and um, and so that's the, still the theme. So everybody was shy when I sent out the email, but if you have interesting cases that are along these lines, we should have time to show a slide or two. So, so dust off those slides and uh, get your camera on your microscope working and uh, plan to share them. Cause I don't think Laura wants to spend the whole hour uh, if I'm correct. Um, and then we are gonna work a little bit today on, I know Marcus has some of these cases, so he's just connecting and listening to us. So Marcus, don't be shy about those good cases you, you're hiding from us. Um, and then um, we are going to work pretty hard to get the mouse uh, pathobiology of the mouse online course uh, revamped. And um, I've talked about that each of the last couple of months. Um, but Bob and our uh, crew, we brought out of their what second or third retirement, Bob? Bob, <laughs> Bob Munn and Clancy Miller have been yeah. working. We have some new organizational um, things. We've talked to some of the educational crowd around here who have um, asked us, um, well, informed us that students these days don't like hour long lectures. They like 20 minutes at a time max. So we're gonna break it into 20 minute sessions. So stay tuned for that at the end. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Laura. Okay, I will start sharing my screen. And let me just get set up here with my pointer. And um, I think I'm going to actually give just a brief um, overview of what I talked about last time. I'll go a little quicker than I had, but I'm not sure that everyone who um, is here today was here last week. So. I'll be showing sort of typical morphology and distribution and, and compare it to the human case. Same with different IHC markers we use, and then go into some um, morphologic variants that can be very confusing. And um, as, as um, was mentioned, it's nice to have whole slides for imaging, but I did create a PowerPoint just because there is so much variety, it would have been just an overwhelming amount of slides. So I, I chose to just do it in this format. So histiocytic sarcoma, as far as the frequency in different organs, it tends to be most common in the liver. And this is according to the in-hand publication that it's liver, spleen, lung, bone marrow, um, et cetera, some other organs. But I have to say what I'll be showing you mostly are images of the liver. And I don't really see it as often in the spleen, um, but it tends to be liver and bone marrow um, Uterus can, can show up also, and I'll show you some images of that. Um, but uh, also what I've seen and according to in hand is that when it is in the spleen, it's usually metastatic and not primary, but it does vary strain to strain. And you can get histiocytic sarcoma and lymphoma in the same animal. And I'll be showing you um, some examples of that. The morphology of the cells can vary widely and that can make it hard to um, make the diagnosis sometimes. It can vary from a typical round cell, tends to have more cytoplasm than, than your typical lymphocytes, but um, not always. Or it can get to being really spindle cell. These are maybe moderately spindle cell, but can really end up looking like a typical spindle cell sarcoma. And I didn't show this last time, but since then I found a slide that, that really shows how it can have a lot of the multinucleated giant cells. This happens to be from a lymph node, but um, when I get see it in the uterus, it, I just happen to notice a lot in, in there too. But you can see, you know, on low power, they just really stand out and you can see a lot of the um, cells on high power. So that's something to watch out for as well. Distribution patterns can vary. So you can see it in the liver, anywhere from being this really nodular discrete foci to being really infiltrative where you have to look really closely to sort of sort out um, what cells are in the sinusoids um, interspersed among all of the hepatocytes. It's not uncommon when it's 
pretty advanced to see vascular invasion. So when we look at this low power mag, you can see that the in internal border of this blood vessel is pretty irregular. And when we look closer, we can see that histiocytic um, sarcoma cells are lining. And um, over here, I, I think I didn't catch it in the picture, but you could see actually where it was extending into and then and stretching along. And over here, you can see sometimes it gets pretty extensive and actually can uh, occlude the blood vessels and um, result in necrosis. But here I'm outlining the, the inner border of the vessel actually, and it's really just infiltrated in and, and thickened um, internally. You can also in these really advanced cases get a lot of necrosis and hemorrhage. And we can see that on low mag by um, these well, large areas of hemorrhage and, and open spaces. When you look more closely um, at sort of lesser affected areas in this same type of tumor, you can see starting areas of necrosis and you start to see the variety of cell types. And often these are associated with these areas of um, extramedullary hematopoiesis, um, predominantly erythroid. Um, but I do wanna point out that it's not only in cases with this really um, advanced hemorrhage and necrosis that you can see EMH, it's really a common phenomenon and it can cause you to have to really sort out the, sub, uh, the cellular populations. And interestingly, um, this EMH can be pretty extensive in the liver, even when the histiocytic sarcoma is not in the bone marrow or the spleen. So if it wasn't infiltrating the bone marrow and filling it, you would think it's a normal reactive EMH. But um, there's cases where the spleen and bone marrow should be able to take care of all of the hematopoiesis, and yet we have this strong EMH in the liver, suggesting there's you know, a growth factor cytokine contribution. There can be a lot of pleomorphism. I showed you the multinucleated giant cells, but you can also have just scattered um, bizarre morphologies, um, one here and up here. There's some sort of embryoid type cells. Um, you can just get so many different morphologies. And this is compared to human, human histiocytic sarcoma. So unlike in mice, um, where it's relatively frequent, it's very rare in humans to see histiocytic sarcoma. And unlike the case in mice where I showed you, you know, it's gonna be very often in liver, in humans, lymph nodes are the most common site. And that's followed by um, other tissues such as the GI tract, spleen, soft tissue, et cetera. And they don't mention liver as being uh, predominantly affected. Um, however, the, the cellular morphology on, on HIMAG is pretty similar. They get a variety, two publications here, one showing the more round cell type morphology and, and this one showing the more spindle cell. And they also can get pretty um, pleomorphic and bizarre looking in humans. Now, moving on to how we identify these using IHC. There's two main markers that we use. Um, there's many you can, but two main, um, yeah. F480 and MAC2. And I'm gonna start here, F480. So um, we can see how it very clearly highlights the histiocytic sarcoma. And um, one thing about F480 is that it's predominantly a surface marker and less or so in the cytoplasm. And so this can cause a problem where it's really labeling the cytoplasmic processes very strongly and, and can extend and surround cells and make it a little hard to see discrete cells. And I'll, I'll show you that later. And um, I have it down here, normal F480 expression in the liver. And you can see obviously you know, how different it is from the histiocytic sarcoma. So um, in the hematopoietic organs, F480 is restricted to only certain subpopulations of macrophages. So in the spleen, it's just in the red pulp, not the white pulp, and I'll show you that later. Um, and then lymph node and thymus, it's also restricted. Um, F480 will label Kupfer cells, as we can see here in the liver, um, and also alveolar macrophages. But if you're using this marker just in, in studies of normal inflammatory states, you have to be careful because it can be downregulated when there's inflammation. And also, if you have any neovascular proliferation, um, you, it will label that endothelium. Um, the F480 antibody is mouse specific, and in humans, the protein isn't um, detected by IHC. The 
The other most common is MAC2. So those images are here on the bottom. And you can see comparing, um, this is obviously the same case. So comparing the IHCs of F480 and MAC2, they are often um, exactly linked. So the same cells that are expressing um, F480 will express MAC2. MAC2 is um, much more, it's also cytoplasm and membrane, but it's predominantly cytoplasm and doesn't as strongly label the membrane. So it's a little more restricted as far as being able to, I will, no, restricted is not the word, it's, it's more localized to be able to see individual cells. And um, unlike F480 in the hemato um, lymphoid system, it labels almost all macrophages. So if I were to label a spleen, it would be pretty much covered um, throughout. Uh, again, like F480 labels Cooper cells and alveolar macrophages. Um, but you also need to be careful because it's not specific for macrophages. It can be on some epithelial cells, and, and um, I notice a lot, you know, the kidney, some of the tubular epithelial cells of the kidney will label. So um, our MAC2 happens to be mouse specific, but it can vary with whatever antibody you're using. Now, comparing it to humans. That um, antibody looks nice. I'm going to be asking you for the clone name later. <laughs> uh, marker that. Oh, OK. <laughs> sure, I can, I can provide that. The marker that they use in um, humans is most often CD163. And those two publications I showed you earlier, they, they both showed it um, strongly diffusely labeling those cell types. However, in mice, um, this is the typical situation. The cells will label for F480 and MAC2, but not as broadly and, and pretty much negative for CD1, murine specific. This is uh, CD163. You'll see a few patches, but pretty much negative. And I hadn't shown you the normal mouse CD163, so that's down here. So again, this is the typical situation in mice for CD163, but Occasionally, you will see a case where they are positive. So this, um, I think this is just a beautiful panel where the, all of the stains match up pretty closely. You can even see the vascular invasion um, being labeled by all three antibodies. Uh, I don't normally run CD163 just because we know it's not often going to be labeled. Um, for this presentation, I, I stained 10 cases and got one to be positive. So I'm, I'm not going to say that that's the normal proportion, but um, that's what I got uh, when I looked for it. It almost looks like that's a different population compared to the Exactly, MAC2. exactly. This brings up a, a whole interesting subject of the different macrophage populations that may contribute to histiocytic sarcoma and if it's going to vary between mouse and human. And it just hasn't been looked into. There haven't, we've, we've talked about, you know, the need for maybe some double labeling studies with F480, MAC2, CD163 um, to sort of sort out those populations. But again, I think that, there, that there's just not a drive for that because histiocytic sarcoma is so rare in humans. Hey, so I've shown you a lot of liver and I wanna show you um, how it presents in some other tissues. Hey, so, it, yes. A uh, quick question on if you go back to the previous slide. I mean, good? How, yeah, I, I just, you know, probably unrelated to this, how did this mice or mouse survive? You know, look at the F480, literally almost 90% of the liver mass is probably histiocytes of some sort. So was this mouse moribund or anything? Just, I'm just curious. I know this is besides the point, if you can comment on that. I mean, uh, yeah, these are old cases, and I think, you know, they, they often do become more moribund. Okay. You know, it's interesting how much liver they can lose. I've seen it with leukemia, too, where, it, you know, it seems like 20%, 30% of the liver is left, and, and mm -hmm. how are they surviving? But, um, you know, they are doing poorly, but <laughs> I, I can't say at what point how much has to be there before they're doing poorly. Yeah. We, we've always observed that when you do lung metastases experiments, it, it's amazing how much of the lung can be replaced by metastases and these mice are still somehow breathing. Um, so I, I think I think this is a similar phenomena, huh? Yeah, Peter Vogel, who I work with, has said that about flu as well, how just so much of it can be affected and, and the mice seem clinically to be not doing so bad. I think it's a little deceptive to see what the F480 standing in that it tends to also surround other cells. So if you actually do 
stains for let's say carcinomas or other say for what I work on melanoma, it almost looks like there's 200% staining. So if you looked at each one of them independently, you'd say, oh, that's almost every cell. And then you put them back to back on the same sections or parallel sections. And you realize that it's like half, you know, and it's not definitely, always, yes, always that disruptive. I definitely agree. Yeah. Yeah. You need to be careful. And I was going to point it out in some of these later ones, but um, yes, so tumor associated macrophages can definitely be labeled um, with F480 and you really have to be careful and, and sort out those cytoplasmic processes. And that's why I said in some cases, you know, MAC2 is better for that because you don't get the wrapping around of other cells. Um, so this uh, is an image I chose for the bone marrow because it's doing, uh, showing um, something that I see occasionally, not in every case, but um, you can see up here that there is hyperostosis of the trabecular bone. And again, must be some sort of um, growth factor cytokine mediated event, but it's not uncommon. And this one is showing extension beyond the bone marrow. This happens to be one that's sort of more spindly looking, but really it can look very much round cell where you almost, you know, you have to sort of think monocytic leukemia versus histiocytic sarcoma, and that gets to be a whole different discussion. Um, and this points out perfectly uh, what Marcus was saying about F480. So it looks like the whole thing is labeled. You can, if you look closely, you'll see little foci of unlabeled cells, but again, it's probably overestimating the amount, but definitely there's more here than in normal bone marrow. And um, I'm sorry, I don't have an image of normal. In the spleen, as I mentioned, it tends to be metastatic. And so you'll see um, foci, individual foci um, on low mag, they'll just be these large, um, very pale eosinophilic nodules interspersed by um, normal red pulp and uh, remaining lymphoid uh, tissue in the white pulp. It's not uncommon in these foci to get uh, central necrosis. And this is, if you look more closely, this happens to be a little bit more round cell and, and you're seeing some of this variation in nuclear size and, and shape. Now, this is what I was mentioning um, as this was an interesting case because um, it kind of affected half the spleen. And so we could see the difference between normal and, and the affected. And this shows you what I was saying about F480, that it's restricted to red pulp macrophages. And you know, there's a few little tendrils coming into the white pulp here, but really um, it's not uh, labeling the white pulp. And if we look at the F480 in the area of histiocytic sarcoma versus this image was taken out here where it's unaffected, you can see how it can be very um, misleading and look like there's, you know, a lot of F480, too many macrophages present, but really that's just, they're all interspersed and interdigitating and, and um, you have to be careful with this. This was also MAC2 positive, but as I said, I wanted to show the, the negative labeling in the F480 white, or by F480 in the white pulp. Uh, it's present in the lungs as well. Often it occurs as perivascular infiltrates. So we can see it here admixed with some just um, lymphocytic, normal lymphocytic inflammation in an old mouse. And it can occur in the galt tissue. Um, generally, uh, it can get pretty bad, um, very expanded, but I haven't really seen GI signs. And I mentioned the uterus. So the uterus is interesting. It's not uncommon to get a situation where just the uterus is affected. And similarly, you'll get situations where it's multisystemic widespread or sometimes just the uterus and the liver. And you really can't sort out, you know, which is first or is it two independent arising uh, situations. But um, uterus is not uncommon in any uterine tumor, you should keep this in mind. This is just a very, I would say that this represents maybe one tenth of the tumor. It really just replaced the whole uterus. And you can see how densely packed there they are. There's um, just some residual um, smooth muscle cells here. At a closer look, they tend to be, uh, this, this case is a round cell type. And the F480 and MAC2 are positive and they nicely show you know, this remaining uh, these remaining smooth muscle cells. And there are some, um, speak, you know, I was showing you the different morphologies and I'm gonna talk about some morphologic variants. Now this is from a human uh, manuscript, but it's the same in mice. So 
they, there are a lot of differentials based on morphology, such as different types of lymphomas, um, melanoma, always you have to keep that in mind, carcinoma. Um, they mention angiosarcoma, what we call hemangiosarcoma, rhabdo, and then unclassified pleomorphic sarcoma. So you can really find a lot of mimics. And uh, these two cases, uh, Jerry Ray shared with me as good examples. So this is one that has a hemangio hemangiosarcoma-like pattern. So on low meg, it almost looks like there's little metastases of hemangiosarcoma with foci of red blood cells. Even you know a little closer up, it, it still looks like that. And you really have to look carefully on high power and determine whether you think these cells are actually making the channels um, or not, but really, you know, it turns out that it's just the way that they're lining the sinusoids makes it look this way. And you definitely need IHC to verify one that looks like this. Um, it can also look, because it gets so spindly, um, it can look like a spindle cell sarcoma and specifically a schwannoma. So this is in the uterus and um, you can see on low meg, just the, the typical patterning um, and then two sort of, um, different patterns. So you're getting kind of the whorling effect over here, and then you almost get varicate body formation. It, it, you know, it, if you didn't do IHC, you would maybe call this schwannoma, um, but indeed um, by IHC labeling, it was a histiocytic sarcoma. Now I'm moving on to sort of a different topic, but it's related and you'll see why I'm, you know, talking about all of these at the same time. So when looking at histios, thinking about histiocytic sarcoma, you need to be aware of this entity called histiocyte associated lymphoma and differentiating it from histiocytic sarcoma. And this is a very helpful paper for that. Our, our own Jerry Ward was on it. And um, what histiocyte associated lymphoma is, um, if we look at the Bethesda proposals, it's um, a subtype of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And so it's a mature B cell neoplasm. But the situation is that there's large numbers, sheets of histiocytes with um, often lower numbers of the lymphoid cells. So if we look at F480 and MAC2, um, there's a, a re relatively predominant or prominent population of those histiocytic cells. And, and we can also see that on H and E. But when you do IHC for the lymphoid markers, you can see that the, specifically these cells that have the large nuclei with, even on IHC, you can see these prominent nucleoli. Those are positive for Pax5, which is a B cell marker. And those are the lymphoma cells. And that's in comparison to just some resident B cells that were present. They're much smaller. You don't see the, the nuclei are much smaller. You don't see the nucleoli as prominently. So you need to sort of be aware and thinking about it when you have a a tumor of, of high histiocyte numbers that hiding in there could be a population of lymphoma cells. Now in the Bethesda protocol, they describe it as these sheets of histiocytes and they state that um, usually greater than 50% are histiocytes, meaning that the, um, you know, less than the, the majority of cells are histiocytes and fewer than that are the lymphoid population. And you do need to also differentiate those from normal associated lymphocytes that can be with histiocytic sarcoma. So this is one, you know, you really can't see much. There's just so many cell types in the liver in here. It's infiltrating in that sinusoidal pattern. We have some foci of <clears throat> EMH. And then by IHC, we can see scattered in here our B cells and T cells. Um, but if you compare, now I know that unfortunately some of the B cells, B220 staining I'm gonna be showing you, it's way too dark and normally we've, we've fixed it since then. Um, but you can tell that these cells are smaller and, and it'll be clearer in, in later uh, situations. But with this um, histiocyte associated lymphoma, since again, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, if you're gonna be cued off by these really large cells. So, in humans, um, the question is, is there a counterpart? And there sort of is, but there's some important differences. So we, they have this entity called T-cell, T-cell-rich large B-cell lymphoma. And 
it is also a subtype of DLBCL, and they've done molecular analyses. They believe it to be specifically of germinal center origin. Um, this, from two different publications, I got these panels, this one on the, the left and right. And um, one of the big differences is that the neoplastic population is much smaller in humans, so less than 10%. They're, they're really cued off by um, very large neoplastic cells. I mean, they really stand out with the CD20 stain um, here. And in this case, they're really standing out. The other difference is that they tend to have a lot more T cells with fewer histiocytes, whereas histiocytes are um, really predominant in the mouse cases. So this is showing in the human, again, the, the T cell component, CD1, three showing the B cell component, or excuse me, the histiocyte component. And part of the reason I brought that up, so again, that was really a lymphoma with a histiocytic component, a reactive normal population, but you can also get in the same mouse histiocytic sarcoma and a B cell le leukemia or lymphoma. So in this liver, again, you can see that there's different cell types, even on low MEG, um, that, that there's mixed population here. When looking at F480 and B220, you can see that there's foci that are definitely aggregates of these F480 positive cells, but there's also aggregates of B220 positive cells, and um, they are negatively labeled by F480. So it's, it's really highlighting the difference here. We look more closely again we've mentioned the, the problem with f480 really spreading and, and not being able to differentiate but you can see these masses of cells um, interspersed with non-labeling cells so um, and and i will mention at this point when making these diagnoses i didn't show you every tissue it would get to be a, a very long presentation but you know the, the the diagnosis is made off multiple organs but if it's interesting if you look more closely here at the B cell leukemia population. So this is a focus that that um, I showed you up here where it's the B cells surrounded by um, F480 positive cells. This focus happens to be um, histiocytes surrounded by these nodules of other cells, some of which are B220 positive cells. And if we look more closely down here, so this is a high MEG, it's a mixed population but I enlarged it to show you that scattered in here are these cells that have much larger nuclei, prominent nucleoli. And when we look at the B220 stain, you can tell there are two different types of cells labeling for B220. So these with the larger nuclei and actually a little bit paler or weaker labeling versus these small, very strongly labeled normal resident B cells. And so this is, you know, as I said, you can have normal B cells just scattered with, within a histiocytic sarcoma. But when you start to see this morphology, um, you look at, at it being a, a lymphoma or leukemia. This particular case um, also had it mixed in the bone marrow and sternum. And so you can see the, the histiocytic cells and then areas where they're, they're less dense, again, you know, I'm beating uh, the drum on this. F480 kind of makes it look like the whole thing is filled with F480 positive cells, but by B220 staining, we can see that that they're present in here. I didn't show a high mag, but by high mag, you could also differentiate that they are the abnormal um, neoplastic B cells, not just resident B cells. And then by F480, you know, you do see these scattered non-labeling cells, but it's definitely kind of overpowering um, the non histiocyte cells. Hello, Laura. In addition, you can get, oh, does someone have a question? Yes, Laura, this is Sibrit. Quick question, how do we differentiate whether this is uh, for the B cells, whether this is a neoplastic process or whether this is probably a cytokine response from, for example, from histiocytes? Is Whether it, the B cells are yes, yes, just you know that not? question, or you know, for example, in the liver, you know, would it be a combination of, for example, EMH or you know, extramedullary lymphopoiesis, 
or hematopoiesis, or how can we rule out that cytokine effect versus neoplastic process? Just question. Right. So for the B cell population, um, as I pointed out, that morphology of being um, the really large nuclei, the prominent nucleoli, you know, those are um, earlier cells. The, the cells like that shouldn't be present in the liver or in the bone marrow. They would only be present, you know, in appropriate places in the spleen. So that tells you that it's it's an abnormal population in the liver. Um, as far as the histiocytes, it it takes a lot of um, looking at the morphology in different organs to sort of determine whether it's the situation of a histiocyte associated lymphoma or if it's a separate histiocytic sarcoma population. And all I can say is it's difficult and there's some cases where I still don't, I've picked one or the other and I'm still not sure, but you know, the investigator didn't care. So we didn't go further to differentiate, but it's really looking at the morphology of the histiocytic cells and um, how widely dispersed they are. In the histiocyte associated lymphoma, one pattern that really helps is that the lymphoma cells tend to be diffusely distributed throughout the sheets of histiocytes and T cells. In the combined cases, it's more like what I showed you here where you have individual foci of cells with um, of different cell types. I hope that helps, but it's it's not an easy question to no, answer. No, it helps. Okay. Uh, definitely. You know, Laura, if you remember like in, in veterinary medicine, you know, uh, we get this, for example, for dogs, they get this cut cutaneous histiocytomas that, you know, they commonly develop, especially in some breeds. And if you go deeper in the circuit, there are these clusters of lymphocytes, you know, coming up a lot. So I we always thought those were induced by, his, you know, cytokine release from those histiocytes. So I was thinking of making that you know, analogy between that and this. So, but I think your, explanation, right. your explanation makes sense. Thank you. Okay. And um, I don't know if I've seen this reported, but I, I admit I didn't really search for combined histiocytic sarcoma and T-cell leukemia, but I've, I've had um, a few cases of this where, again, low power, you can see the more eosinophilic larger cells and then some foci of um, cells that are, are more densely packed. And when you look closely at these densely packed cells, they're, they're clearly abnormal, um, sort of blastic looking cells versus these more eosinophilic type cells. And these are almost starting to look spindly. And when we do IHC, you can see that there's um, large aggregates. This area didn't show it so well, just because I wanted to show both cell types in one spot. but as I said um, with Hebert just previously, there were large aggregates of just MAC2 positive cells, large aggregates of just CD3 positive cells. And here we can see that it's those, those large cells that are indeed CD3 positive. And again, looking at other tissues to determine whether these are actually two neoplastic populations um, is essential. So I'm gonna, um, refer back now, thinking about the histiocyte associated um, lymphoma, those were um, a subtype of diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which is a um, mature cell type. And that's in contrast to what they see in humans, where you actually can get a situation where diverse lymphoid malignancies can transform into histiocytic sarcoma. And um, this particular paper was looking at mutations and they found that very often the RAS MAP kinase pathway is affected. Um, so, you know, it, it, it can occur. I, I shouldn't say it's completely different. It can occur with mature and one type being the diffuse large B cell lymphoma, but also with precursor B and T. So, um, it's common, more probably more commonly with B cell, and this particular paper looks specifically at transformation of B cell lymphomas into histiocytic sarcoma. It's very rare, 
um, as they mentioned, two to eight percent of, of CLL or a small lymphocytic leukemia or lymphoma can transform. Um, but just, uh, but sorry, what they saw in this paper is that the two populations of cells actually have some identical structural rearrangements which is what leads them to believe that it's not two independent tumors, that it's actually a transformation uh, of this tumor. And in, in none of the cases that I've had that had both of these, were we able to um, look to see, um, to prove indeed that they had same, the same changes or that they um, were both neoplastic, it would, the, the proof, you know, would be to, uh, transplant them and see if you could grow them secondarily and get again two different populations, but I've never been able to be in a situation like that to truly see. Um, so in summary, um, we've gone over the different cellular morphologies that um, histiocytic sarcoma can present in. Very common in the liver, but also other um, organs can be affected. You'll want to use a panel of IHC markers because even though I showed F480 and MAC2 a, a lot and being in combination, it's not always the case that both, it may be one or the other. Um, people commonly also can use lysozyme, but that's not necessarily specific for macrophages. So you'll want to be combining it with one of these other markers. IBA1 is another really good pan macrophage marker, but just like F480, it has that that tendency to label um, the tendrils and, and it can also be difficult to interpret those. You need to be aware of some morphologic mimics of different types of sarcoma and then be paying attention to the associated lymphocyte population, whether you're just normal mature B and T cells, whether you may actually have just a lymphoma with a lot of normal histiocytes or whether you have a mixture of both of these neoplastic cell types. And finally, I want to give special thanks to Dr. Ray. He uh, provided me with a lot of discussion on, on differentiating these and, and identifying them. And um, I'll still uh, not be as good at identifying the diffuse large B cell lymphomas. Um, it's really a morphologic diagnosis and I see a lot more leukemia, but he's an expert at that. And then for providing the cases that I showed. Um, so that is all I have. That was awesome. <clears throat> Laura, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, you may want to mention that the F480, when you're dealing with inflammation as well, it also stains uh, eosinophils. It cross-reacts with eosinophils. So F480, so it, when you're dealing with inflammation, becomes very difficult because you have endothelial cells that will stain it, uh, stain with F480. And then you have eosinophils, which will also stain with F480. So it's, a, it's not a very good uh, marker when dealing with inflammation. Okay, thank you. So Jerry, um, you gave us a really good rundown on eosinophils last year, and I'm not remembering, does it distinguish between some of the types you were talking about? What was the question? The question is, does the F480 distinguish between, you know, the myriad types of eosinophils that you told us about whenever it was last year? I think that maybe you're, are you thinking, oh, thinking of the mast cells? Presentation oh, of mast oh. cells? Yeah, yeah, you're thinking of the mast cells having different types. I gotcha. So, Laura, this is Marcus. Uh, really, really great presentation. Um, and yeah, I think the comments with regard to the human cases of, um, you know, they'll probably even usually say quote unquote histiocytic sarcoma because they're so rare. It's really, really remarkable um, because for how common they are as cells and tissue, you'd think they'd be much more common. Uh, and there have been problems in the human diagnostic side where sort of the MFH type thing where people kind of view those as being histiocytes, which clearly in retrospect are not um, generally. They're lyomass or almost other things you know, when you do a little more immunohistochemistry. Uh, some things that kind of come a little bit closer like plasma cytoid dendritic cell malignancies, which you can see sometimes. They're not histiocytes per se, but they're myeloid lineages that have, you know, some of those features and stuff too. But, um, you know, in working in large sarcoma practices in my past, just 
the number of cases that are believable are, are really, really low, um, which is weird. And, and in mice, I don't do nearly as much as all of you guys do in terms of broad-based things, but even looking, I, I thought it was like CDCAN2A, P53, null backgrounds. We'd see these all the time, you know, exactly the morphologies you're looking at. One of the things I've done more recently, which is an interesting wrinkle to this, is uh, in immune-related adverse events, so all these new immune therapies in human cancer that are now being used, um, we were developing a new one, which is an agonist CD40 antibody. So it's just a therapy that stimulates the immune system, but we got a liver toxicity that looks very much like these histiocytic sarcomas in that the pattern morphologically would be pretty much overlapping. There's hemorrhage and necrosis locally in this context as well. The histiocytes on the inside of your central veins or other structures in the liver also uh, mimic there and also have B cell aggregates or B220 positive aggregates uh, as well. Um, but those resolve for some reason. But um, I would never have guessed that we would see that. Marcus, we want pictures. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, actually that sounds really interesting. And, and, and all of this makes me think about, you know, I've been thinking a lot about on the human side, the toxicities related to our immunotherapies. And most of our immunotherapies, of course, are to... Um, to block the um, recognition of tumors as self, right? So uh -huh. tumors are learning tricks to be considered self. And so the toxicities, of course, are autoimmune largely. But it, that, it, this whole thing makes you think that there is this delicate balance, this tightrope of not recognizing self, but recognizing tumors and or recognizing infections. And mice, of course, are extremely good at clearing infections compared to us people. Um, so there's there's definitely something different that I think we're we're getting close to here. And and I think the fact that mice get histiocytic sarcomas and we basically don't is probably related to all that. Uh, it, if you want, I can show three quick pictures uh, if <laughs> since since yeah. you asked. Ah, uh, <laughs> you know I want. <laughs> That's great because to hear that you've seen it resolve, I mean, that's that's the information that we don't have is what happens right. after that. And what um, we've presented before um, and was presented last week about the, the NSGs and the NSGSGM3 with these histiocytic proliferations, they really could look malignant. It's so activated. And, and we went on the you know, took a lot of different lines of evidence to, to convince ourselves it was as more reactive, but not getting to prove it really. So here, I'll stop sharing and let you that's show great us. Thing. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, so this is uh, the, I'll be separate images. So hopefully you can see that uh, yep. as an h &E image. So, so, you know, this actually happens in rag mice as well. So it's not adaptive immune dependent, which is kind of cool. And we see agonist CD40 on endothelial cells. But if you look here, sort of, um, I don't know if you can see my point or not, but on the right-hand side of the screen, there's a, a vascular space that has some red blood cells and a <laughs> sort of shaggy lining, which is uh, histiocytic. And on the left, there's a, we also see thromboses in this particular setting. And in the middle of the image, you can see there's sort of a necrotic area with things that look like sort of small histiocytes um, kind of scattered around and then I'll just go show really quickly um, the F480. And uh, if you remember Laura's uh, image of the F4, oh, sorry, that's, I gotta stop share first and it didn't pop up. So the F480 standing that Laura had shown, it's not, oh, I'm sorry, there we go. And is that now looking like an IHC stain? Yes. Great, so Laura had shown so the F4 is standing in normal liver and it's very well dispersed. It's kind of like these individual cells that one sees in the upper left-hand corner. Um, it's sort of just absolutely kind of spread out. And what we see here is aggregates that come up. Uh, some of them are larger than this. This isn't the biggest set. Um, some areas where it's not clear if these are, they look like granulomas right in the middle of that image, but they're pretty F480 low. So I don't know exactly what that represents. And then the last thing I will show, hopefully this will actually still work, um, will be the uh, B220 just to kind of round things out. But, um, the, you know, 
we see these effects rather quickly. And then the mice live, the one uh, it's pretty rare to have mortality due to this. And that's the B220 staining. Again, you can see sort of the granulomatous area. Um, there's no really clear aggregates, maybe in the upper left-hand corner, you can see a few probable histiocytes or, you know, or, or F480 positive cells. But um, this was kind of saying, we can see like 15% of the liver being necrosed uh, in that context. And they will, they will actually get through that most of the time. The only deaths we see occasionally have been in rag mice, uh, which may have to do with lack of clearing antibody. Hmm. Um, but anyway, very, so. Very interesting. Um, oh, can so, I ask a question? Um, yep. this yeah. the purpose, uh, are, what do you think that is? Because so, is, is when we have opportunistic uh, problems. So, so uh, you broke up a little bit, but I think the question was, what do I think that is? <laughs> yeah. from, and, and so we don't really know, aside from saying, here's what we're seeing, right? So the problem, so F CD40 as a target on is on histiocytes. It's also on dendritic cells, endothelial cells, and potentially on platelets and things like that. So we think there's a clotting abnormality, a, a thrombotic abnormality that results in the infarction and the necrosis we're seeing locally, but why the B cells, uh, which also are affected by CD40, are forming aggregates in the liver, we have no idea. Uh, it's just striking that it happens also in the malignancies. I mean, so the, what Laura is saying too, we never saw those resolve in the context of germline deficiency of a major tumor suppressor. Those were discovered when my, mice were you know, agonal and you would sack the mice and look, the liver was just chock full of stuff, just like you were describing. In this case, we do timed euthanasias of mice to see what's happening along the way. And we would see these little white punctate things grossly on the liver and then sectioned and looked at a little bit more. So, you know, I'm sad to say, I don't really have a great answer for that. Steroids block it nearly completely. So if we give high dose steroids before, like people do in humans, um, that uh, results in pretty much no effects on liver. Marcus? Yeah. Have you done any, oh, sorry. Have you done any no. markers for um, like MAC2 or CD68, perhaps to, to show if there's infiltrating monocytes for just the resident population? Yes. So, so a couple things. I think also um, uh, Dr. Vogel's uh, looking at talking about um, things being reported as marginal B-cell lymphomas. So, so, so now that we have sort of better tools to look at these things, so I'd say that the that macrophage subtypes that people talk about, this is just my own subjective view, like M1, M2, MDSCs in the tumor context, but even other contexts are pretty much just crap. We never really see those in tissue exactly the same way. And we've done a lot of single cell RNA sequencing on that. And we just don't see those subsets. And we see huge effects. We've also done single cell RNA sequencing in exactly the same cases we're talking about here intratumorally. And we see massive effects on the transcriptomes of macrophages, even one day after initiation of therapy. And we don't see clonal proliferations of B cells. So we don't see uh, that. It's also odd that they would resolve you know, uh, over time. Um, but, but it's, you know, it's not like we've really worked it up fully, but, um, it is a striking effect. It's not clear this happens fully in humans, although ALT and AST abnormalities are pretty common and people don't tend to do liver biopsies, uh, to, to work those up. So how do we, um, document and, and sort of fight back against the M1, M2 fallacy? <laughs> um, and, it, it, and we can we can take this offline with a beer one day, Marcus. But um, it, you know, I've come to believe that um, some of the individuals spear, spearheading that at high levels at the MCI are um, not to be believed for any purpose. <laughs> well, well, just the the two second version of it is that it should never have been possible that that was true anyway. So M1 and M2 are usually bone derived macrophages that people treat with high dose cytokines ex vivo, and they all have the same morphology around the world. But then when you try to find that same, you know, transcriptome and surface expression in like tumors or any tissue, any tissue at all, 
we never see the same things. And now with the higher dimensional fingerprint, like single cell RNA-seq, it's very clear that they're nothing like those at all. Right. And when you do co-cultures of things that are M1 and M2 with other things, they tend to revert to more what we see just in tumors. Right. And, and, and uh, there's probably a lot of plasticity in macrophages that depends on what cytokines they're seeing, rather than these lineage arguments that people like to make. But people have been spending their careers supporting these ideas. So take them on at your own peril because, I know, uh, I know. you know, uh, you have to say M1 like or something like that. So I'm trying to purge it from anything I write from now on, but it's not easy. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll think about whether there's a way to bring some sense to the nonsense. Um, and I'll call you first. Um, One we have just a, Jerry, go ahead. One comment in reference to um, the EMH that we see in in the liver with these uh, histiocytic uh, tumors, you normally only see it when it's mainly involving that of the liver. And I would uh, propose that that suggests that these cells are secreting some cytokine that is stimulating this EMH. Yeah, and yeah that's highly... Yeah, the case. And do, do you see like full on, like do you see like um, megakaryocytes uh, or is it mostly reds? Uh, you know, because you probably can guess a little bit as to what's it's not being... only It's not only reds. You'll also see it with granulocytes as well. You'll see neutrophils in there, mm. uh, sometimes e eosinophils. So I, I think that those cells are probably uh, secreting some form of uh, could be them or the endothelial cells associated with the sinusoid. It's hard to say for sure, but uh, but I think they're they're stimulating this EMH as a result of some cytokine being uh, secreted by the cells or the endothelial cells. Yeah, Jerry, could it also be that you know, irrespective of the presence of histiocytes or others, could it be that you know these are rodents and whenever you know they are in a more even or compromised situation they kind of crank up their EMH too. So would that be also part of their general, you know, response to their poor health condition? Well, we, we know that uh, EMH uh, always occurs with almost any type of tumor, but uh, at the same time, the, these bone marrows and these animals look very normal. And uh, so why is it occurring? Well, but you don't see it with all the time. But I, I, I suspect that it's just somewhere they're secreting some type of cytokine that's stimulated. And it could be the same thing with other tumors that we're seeing some cytokine that's being stimulated as well in the mouse that is uh, causing this as well. And we just don't know it. Or even tumor associated macrophages themselves producing mm -hmm. the, sim the same cytokine. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna call a close to this discussion, although there's obviously much more to talk about when it comes to mouse and human macrophages. Um, and I'm gonna turn the floor over to Bob um, and just a quick kind of update on where we are with getting the mouse pathobiology course um, um, updated. Um, and I wanna thank the people who have volunteered already, this dates back many months to look at specific courses and um, because Corey's got such a nice picture there, Corey Brayton volunteered to look at a couple of Steve Barthold's old lectures and help us re redo those. But I know there are some other volunteers as well. So please, um, I don't know, Tyler, can you show the list of the course titles? And we're, we're as I alluded to, we're trying to break this into slightly smaller chunks for the students. Um, so, um, few of the volunteers that we had a while back are listed. Um, but look at the list and, and let me know whether you think there's something um, that you'd like to look at the old content. It may be perfectly good. Just do a quick audit or you may find things you want to update. When we get into tier 1B, it's going to be even more important. For example, I know that I did a lecture back then on how to engineer a mouse and um, the technology for engineering a mouse has changed a lot in the last 15 years. So uh, we're going to have to um, update tier 1B as well. But we're going to start with tier 1A, which is really basic pathology stuff. And, and just to remind everybody, um, we all interact with 
biochemistry labs, molecular biology labs, graduate students and postdocs in those labs that um, did not have the benefit of having a pathology course in their medical school. And so this kind of catches them up, we hope. Um, we hope that by the end of going through tier 1B, they can recognize basic things, not make big mistakes. They can have a good sense of um, how to handle the tissue and, and how to make good use of an expert pathologist and be able to talk the language a little bit. So that's sort of the goal is that uh, this becomes a free, we want it to be a free way for um, you know, students in molecular biology and biochemistry to become um, familiar with everything that we know so well in terms of what the mouse is and how to think about pathology uh, and the context of pathology in their research. Uh, go back to 1A, if you would, Tyler. And um, Bob, do you have additional comments? Um, yeah, it's, so what I think uh, one of the things you need to note here is how uh, we've broken up uh, um, 1A. So uh, what uh, previously was uh, uh, a uh, gross uh, anatomy of the mouse and histology of the mouse has been broken down into uh, organ systems. And uh, that gives us a, a lot more uh, leeway. Uh, the other uh, courses, the other uh, portions of the course have been broken down. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll continue uh, working with people to, to uh, work these out. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, one of the things that you uh, uh, need to, uh, or we need to uh, do is uh, there's a um, uh, or uh, a um, course on or a uh, lesson on basically laboratory medicine that uh, badly needs to be updated. And so, uh, if somebody has a uh, lecture on mouse uh, uh, laboratory medicine. Uh, that they uh, would like to contribute, that'd be wonderful. We can do that. And yeah, that's, I mean, that reminds me um, updating the existing um, slides andor course is, is one option. Another option is to bring in a lecture that you've already prepared for whatever reason and, um, or more than one. Um, all of these sort of originated in that fashion where we adapted lectures that other people you know, that, that, our, that our faculty had already kind of put together. Um, and then we filled in the gaps, as it were, with new lecture style uh, presentations on the stuff that seemed like it was missing. So both are possible. Um, and we're happy to add additional content going forward uh, where it fits. But I think this gives a pretty complete overview. Um, in the past, we've given um, online students a certificate documenting that they pass this. And we do have quizzes and testing that um, allows them to document their learning and allows us to give those certificates. We could bring that back if there's a lot of interest in that. But for the moment, I'd just like to get the content updated. Questions, issues? Volunteers? Marcus, you're on skin. <laughs> All righty. All right. With that, I'll let I, you go. I, I, I can volunteer male repro, um, reproductive pathology and the likes, but um, it is a timeline that I'm a little bit, you know, just, you know, what I can put time-wise. Otherwise, I think I have enough material for male repro. I can try that. Awesome. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll be sending out emails um, with the um, opportunities to kind of pick and choose. And then I think we're in a position now, I hope, Bob, where we can send out the PowerPoints that we do have, as yes. well as the, um, the voiceover transcripts that we do have, all of which um, is open for updating. Um, we'll do this the same way where we'll, we'll have um, PowerPoints that'll get converted to one of the online 
um, video style course slideshows. And I forget which software we've decided to use, but uh, stay tuned on that. We're using Canvas. Canvas. That's what uh, the uh, School of Medicine is using in their courses. Yep. Okay. So those of you who are familiar with Canvas can teach me. <laughs> All right, with that, I'm gonna sign off. Thanks everybody. Thanks very much, Laura, for an outstanding presentation, a good overview. And uh, you got me thinking again about macrophage IHC. So I'll be asking you about which clones you like best. Um, and we have uh, the ability to do multicolor. So doing that multicolor experiment you mentioned, I think is a good one. Good, you're welcome. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Fun.